Ferus megalodon, the fossil shark that quite easily is the most famous prehistoric whale assassin of all time, is one of the many animals that is still theorized to currently swim our oceans today. Today, the internet is swamped with clickbaity news articles, hundreds of YouTube videos, and innumerable comment sections that lay proof that a lot of people are convinced that this fossil species is, well, not so fossilized and is still swimming out there. So, is it? No, dude. And here's eight reasons why. Reason number one, fossil record. The fossil record is admittedly incomplete, and until time travel is unlocked, we'll always require more material. But there certainly are trends. For example, we can be effectively certain that dinosaurs died out at the end of the Cretaceous period because even after many excavations, no dinosaur fossils have been found in the newer rock layers. Similarly, the same holds true with Megalodon dying out just before the last ice age. Megalodon didn't really leave traces of full-body skeletons as we know them, but what it did leave were some big teeth. Plenty of them. Every single megalodon would have gone through thousands of teeth in its lifetime, and to this day, they are one of the most common marine fossils in the rock layer where the big shark hails from. Now, note that not a single trace of them has ever been found above several million years ago. Additionally, fossils like whale bones from after that time period show zero evidence of megalodon bite marks, which were abundant in older fossils. And before we begin to talk about these seemingly younger findings, let's move over to reason number two, that one tooth found by the crew of the HMS Challenger. The HMS Challenger was a 2100-ton Corvette-class sailing ship that was used in a landmark study of the deep ocean. It was this expedition that laid the groundwork for modern oceanography. Amidst discovering thousands of new species and mapping out portions of the seafloor including the deepest part of the ocean, their deep-sea equipment also dredged up numerous fossils. One in particular was this one. Many would look at this and say, well, this looks like a relatively young fossil and couldn't have belonged to an animal that died millions of years ago. Well, hold on just a minute. It is true that a scientist attempted to date how old these teeth were with a new technique using manganese dioxide. He thought that material accumulated at a steady rate and could be used for dating how old something was. The result was that a possible survival date for this megalodon was only 11,000 years ago, at the very end of the most recent ice age. Way more recent than the typically accepted two to three million year extinction date. However, science works by double-checking its own findings. Not all of the teeth collected agreed with the 11,000-year date, and there was concern that the modern dating technique was not accurate. After another review, it was shown that manganese dioxide collects at unpredictable rates on teeth versus normal rock, so this method really wasn't reliable. After some re-evaluation, it was found that this seemingly young tooth was in fact multiple millions of years old. In every other occasion megalodon teeth have been dated, the time of extinction firmly remains at about two to three million years. We're almost certain some of you watching this may have this fish in mind. The coelacanth fish that supposedly went extinct with the dinosaurs way older than the megalodon. If this little fella could survive and adapt, then one of the ultimate apex predators could too, right? Not so fast, dude. Reason number three, the coelacanth misconception. Yes, the coelacanth getting revealed to the outside world in the 1930s was a fantastic surprise, but local fishermen and sailors in Madagascar and Indonesia had been finding them for centuries. Western science just never bothered to check, even when some fishermen might have tried to tell them. This animal, unlike the megalodon, was, uh, is an animal that thrives in deeper waters where underwater slopes, volcanic islands, and canyons are abundant. During an extinction event or catastrophic ecological shift, these smaller animals are usually the ones that can adapt much easier than the larger apex predators. Megalodon was a predator that preferred a specific type of environment because of the type of food that they needed. They don't really adapt well to sudden changes, and when extinction does happen, as mighty as they are, it's usually the big apexes that are the first to go. Their populations tend to be small as is, and they require lots of resources to grow. So any slight upset to their food chain can send them spiraling into extinction. It's usually the small, generalist, reclusive species, like coelacanths, that tend to survive as the huge apex Apex species fall. Speaking of size, a small reminder that not all megalodon sharks were gargantuan beasts. Reason number four, the offspring. 
perhaps an angle that some of you haven't considered yet. Large sharks are K-selective reproducers, meaning they invest a lot of energy into just a few offspring at a time. So they don't spawn with thousands of eggs, they're born alive, active, and big enough to hunt from day one. With a long lifespan, the existence of a full-grown megalodon usually meant that there would be at least a dozen juveniles swimming about. So, even if the adults were smart enough to not make mistakes or remain reclusive enough to be where humans wouldn't spot them, the kids are a different matter. Recent studies indicate that young and inexperienced white sharks, not the big imposing adults, are likely responsible for most accidental attacks on humans. So if the Megalodon was still alive today, where are all the 80 to 30 foot juveniles swimming around taking test bites out of boats or boaters alike? Furthermore, if they were indeed still alive today, we'd see the chowing down on smaller predators like great whites and orca. We'd see a lot more whale carcasses, especially with huge teeth marks and bites in them, and fresh remnants of colossal teeth, since a whale would be just about the only thing big enough to fuel Megalodon today. Would they instead thrive in deeper waters? Modern-day deep oceans do have a rich and diverse cast of creatures, but all of them down here have to be specially adapted to an environment with some of the least amount of food on the planet. Animals like deep-sea giant isopods, hagfish, or deep-sea dogfish often have to go weeks, months, maybe even years without eating. The most nutrient-rich food for them is often dead whales sinking down from the surface after other scavengers like white sharks took most of the choice cuts already. These guys down here can survive off the scraps because of special adaptations to hibernate or fast for a very long time. Cold-blooded with extremely low metabolisms, the exact opposite of what Megalodon had. But can't they just hunt down large squid? The problem is that there is already someone else doing that with far better adaptations to do it. Sperm whales can dive deeper, find squid faster with sonar, and shut them down faster than Megalodon ever could. Remember, Megalodon had adaptations to hunt whales and seals, not try to find squid in pitch black water. Oh, but wait! How can we be 100% certain still if most of the ocean still remains unexplored? Well, see, in reason number five, we'll find that the unexplored ocean is really a whole lot of nothing. We've all heard the same lines over and over again. So much of the ocean is unexplored. Anything could be down there. There's always a bigger fish. Nowadays, the term usually has it at around 80 to 95% of the ocean is unexplored. But that really doesn't mean what people think it means. The sobering reality is a vast majority of the ocean is barren. Areas of large, empty space in the ocean almost never have large animals in them, aside from those just briefly passing through. The reason you don't see a megalodon swimming around in the middle of the ocean is the same reason you won't see a gorilla walking around in the Sahara. Let's remember the food chain. Big fish eat smaller fish. In the ocean, the base of the food chain is plankton, and plankton is largely restricted to areas near the coast or large islands. Just like every other kind of plant, phytoplankton needs certain minerals and nutrients, and they can get this from river runoff from dry land. If we look at this chart, you'll see what we mean. This is global plankton distribution. More green equals more green food, which is where the fish that would sustain the bigger predators would be at. This is the exact reason why all of the fossil record implies that Megalodon was a pretty near-shore animal. That's where the best food was. Also, the places where life clusters are the same places humans frequent with their harvests, shipping, and damage they leave behind. Here is where Megalodon and their offspring would thrive in, if they were still alive. But of course, there's at least a few of you watching that still have the idea that Megalodon may be living in some deep trench under the ocean. We'd hate to burst your bubble here, but reason number six will make you realize that the Mariana Trench is practically a death sentence. To this very year, there are abundant clickbait videos and even news articles speculating that the most massive shark ever can be found at the most massive depths. Megalodon being associated with the Mariana Trench goes back as far as the aforementioned Challenger Expedition Tooth Discovery, but popular belief latched onto it quite intensely. The problem is, living in the Mariana Trench takes everything difficult about living in the deep ocean and multiplies it. We're talking about a trench that is deep enough that if you sunk Mount Everest into it, you'd still have well over a mile between the peak and the surface. Contrary to popular belief, there aren't any big animals down here. The largest animals down here are measured in inches, not feet or meters. Not even giant squid live down at this depth. They don't even dive down half the way to the mouth of the trench, let alone in it. It's that deep. 
Not even deep sea specialists like sleeper sharks can thrive within the trench. Megalodon would never have nearly enough food nor the physical adaptations to get down here. So those depictions in movies of massive sharks and squid living down here in large numbers is pretty much why these movies are categorized as science fiction. Another popular work of science fiction that many people took it as a true life story was a production of Discovery Channel's titled Megalodon The Monster Shark Lives as part of its yearly Shark Week. And if you didn't already know, for reason number seven, we have to clarify that this mockumentary wasn't real. To Discovery Channel's merit, however, this mockumentary was pretty well done. Maybe too well done, especially after an online poll by Discovery Channel showed 70% of the viewers believed Megalodon was still alive. Colin Drake, the main character of this mockumentary, was actually named Darren Meyer, and it was only after there was a lot of backlash that Discovery bothered to add a disclaimer at the beginning, saying the program was a work of fiction. A disclaimer that a lot of online releases and pirated video uploads didn't have. Even those who were aware the production was a work of fiction might have still mistakenly thought that some of the facts stated by Colin Drake were true, such as the likelihood of something big in the unexplored regions of the ocean or the HMS Challenger finding megalodon teeth only a couple of thousand years old versus millions. Which, as we already discussed, they weren't. Shark Week in general throughout the 2010s was widely criticized by actual scientists for being basically televised clickbait and having very few actual marine biologists involved. Despite the heavy backlash, the Megalodon mockumentary got a sequel the following year, Megalodon The New Evidence. To be fair, Shark Week did improve, and in 2018 Discovery Channel even mocked itself with a special called Megalodon Fact vs. Fiction, which basically consisted of numerous experts roasting the original mockumentary. Behind every rumor or slight speculation, there's always a conspiracy behind it, and something the mockumentary claimed that gained a lot of traction with some conspiracy theorists out there is that there is genuine evidence for Megalodon still roaming the oceans, but groups like the Navy, tourism boards, and fisheries are hiding it. Reason number eight, the cover-up. Just stop and think for a moment how many thousands upon thousands of people would have to be involved and not a single person leaks the truth? even though that would make you probably one of the most famous people on the planet for rediscovering Megalodon? Shark tourism has proven an economic boom for a lot of coastal areas. If some operations are willing to pay hundreds to thousands of dollars to see great whites, hammerheads, or even just reef sharks in their natural habitat, imagine the amount of money people would be willing to pay to see a Megalodon alive. If the Meg was alive, it would be the tourism boards and not the shark that would be chomping at the bit to show it off. It would only take one leak out of the potential thousands of insiders for the tourism industry to relentlessly seek out Megalodon, and if it was real, it would likely be found rather quickly. On a sadder note, tens of millions of sharks are harvested from the ocean every year to make bogus medicine off their cartilage. Desperate people scared of cancer have been lied to for years that shark cartilage keeps you from getting it. Now consider how much cartilage you would get out of a few hundred pounds of mako versus multiple tens of tons of megalodon. You can bet a lot of fisheries would be packing explosive harpoons if the literal motherload of shark cartilage could be hunted down. And now think of just how hard it would be for a gigantic shark that eats whales and lives near the surface to not get noticed by anybody with a cell phone these days. Millions of people go to the beach, fly over the ocean in airplanes, or get on boats themselves that usually stick pretty close to the plankton-rich parts of the sea. The chances nobody would have taken a damn clear image since the creation of cameras is borderline impossible nowadays. We leave you off with a few farces of evidence. Considering how many farces of proof videos there are existing claiming Megalodon is still alive, we'll end this episode with a few of these videos to set the facts straight. This infamous video is not from the Mariana Trench, and no, this isn't Megalodon. This was shot off the coast of Tokyo in 2003 and is what is called a Pacific Sleeper Shark, a genuinely large deepwater species. This picture is from the Discovery Channel mockumentary and is edited. Here's the image with no shark, no traces of water disturbance around the fin, bear the fact that the Photoshop dude had no knowledge that a big object moving this fast along the surface will surely leave a trail. This footage has a CGI shark from the fake documentary, this one too, and yeah, the rest of these.